little Sausalito Public Library is a gem. And there's thousands of these gems, like lovingly cared for and maintained, and they're nurturing their communities. And these people are in constant contact with their communities, especially the teen librarians, who are the rock stars, as far as I'm concerned. So there I was, I walked in, and you know, it, we're in this, I don't know about San Francisco, it's pretty mellow here, but it, in where I live in New York, it's loud, it's noisy, it's fast, and a library is a haven. It's a haven of quiet and peace and learning and, and much more, actually, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep coming back to the librarians because you'll see, it's not just because I'm doing this talk here today. Um, they really are instrumental. And so, of course, I always check out the graphic novel section. And you see, I was very happy to see whoever is curating the Sausalito teen and middle grade graphic novel section, my heart goes out to you, <laughs> whoever you are. But there's a lot of first second. There was Five Worlds. There was my book to dance that I did with my wife, Sienna. And those were face out, you know, it's just like. And so, and this is just one, I just happened to wander into a little local library. And it happens to be here, you know, thousands of miles away from home, but, I, but it happens I can be in Oklahoma, I can be in, in Texas, I can be in Columbus, Ohio, and there's these marvelous places. So we'll see how they played a part. But first, second, books, what have I got here? So this is some of our gang, it's not everybody. Uh, we were just in the middle of doing a launch presentation. Uh, we signed up this new web comic called Check Please by Ngozi Okezu. Some of you are nodding your heads. It's a very, very popular web comic. And it's about, uh, it, it's a hockey story. So we, we made hockey jerseys for a second. And that's some of our gang. Andrew is our art director. Callista is my fellow editor. Robin is a junior editor. Next to her is Connie Shu, who's also a Roaring Brook editor and a, a really great editor, but she works with First Second as well. She did like Real Friends and some really good stuff recently. Uh, and Chiara Valdez, who's our most junior editor. And there's others missing here, but who you know, Gina was mentioned already and some people who really should be there. This is where we work. We're, it's all Macmillan publishers, and First Second is part of Macmillan, which is one of the big five, they call them, the big five publishing houses. So it's all Macmillan. There's uh, some really classy publishing goes on in that building. And for us, of course, the fact that we publish comics, this is a really cool address in New York, because you might know it as the Daily Bugle. But not everybody. Sometimes the flat iron just has its own cred, right? So OK, so I get this really interesting question. Uh, I'm not going to give you today the whole, the, the history of graphic novels in America in the last 10, 15 years. But hopefully, in the course of this presentation, you'll get a sense that, A, an incredible transformation has happened for comics publishing in America and worldwide. And B, we are in a creative moment of a, a kind of renaissance and an explosion of quality work, uh, probably without precedent. And we'll look back on this time as certainly some kind of golden age for a new kind of graphic novel. And, and I think First Second is kind of right in there in the center stage of supporting that. I hope so. So the question I get is, does for a second have a secret recipe? And by the way, this is actually from my kitchen. I make a mean broth <laughs> twice a year. And in fact, you tasted it when we were doing mocha. You guys, like I gave you my immune elixir broth. Tons of fresh vegetables. Sorry, am I off topic again? I'm Mr. Tangent. I should warn you. I do go off, but so does First Second have a secret recipe? And yes, it does, and, and I'm gonna tell you what it is. Would you like to know the First Second secret recipe?
first ingredient, brilliant, talented, skilled creators. And we go to great lengths to find them and keep them. And sometimes when you can't find them, make them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you don't actually make them. But you can support and nurture. And, and sometimes you can identify someone who's a little green, but you can tell there's greatness coming. So there's some of that as well. And that, uh, let's look at that ingredient a little closer, and I'll just share a few glimpses, okay? There's gonna be a few little portraits. They're randomly selected. There's many others that could be in this presentation that aren't. Uh, we have a lot signed up already, and we have about 120 projects in the works. Uh, so they can't all be in here. But this one, Andrew mentioned already, <laughs> probably doesn't need much introduction here, of all places. But Jean, interestingly enough, Jean is a big piece of the first second history and first second becoming what it is today. And what's very strange about doing this exhibit, which is the first retrospective on first second, doing it at the Museum of Cartoon Art or with the Museum of Cartoon Art, in San Francisco is there's a weird full circle with the beginnings of First Second. And there was a dinner, a very fateful dinner at the slanted door in the Embarcadero. And I told the story to the librarians here the other day um, about 12 years ago. And there was Chun, who's sitting right there, whose project you're gonna be hearing a lot more about in the next couple of years. And so Chun was there at this dinner, Jean was there, Derek Kirk Kim was there, Alex Puviland and Lewin Pham were there. And I think that's who, that, and that was the start of First Second. Now, Jean almost wasn't at that dinner because Derek had sent me a bunch of his friends' projects and there was this unfinished thing called American Born Something and it came in and it was already an avalanche of submissions before we even had a name for the imprint. I can't remember if we had a name by that point, but I think we were just getting it going. And Derek was um, pestering me about this friend Gene of his. He's like, have you read it? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And you know, I'm basically, should I, do I need to move this? No, you're good? And I was planning to get to it, and then I was flying out to San Francisco, and we were going to have a dinner there, and it was, you know, and, and at, basically at the last minute he said, if you don't take the thing on the plane and read it, I'm not coming to dinner. So he forced my hand. I took the thing, I read it on the plane, and it didn't even have that last chapter. If you've read American Born Chinese, that's the key to the whole thing. It didn't have that. It wasn't in color, and it blew my mind. And we, I landed... And first thing, I could use my cell phone, I go, Derek, bring this guy to dinner. And then a few weeks later, we're signed up. And, and at the time, these were a gang of friends and many others, it was Lark Peen and Jason Shiga and like the whole mostly Asian, crazy, super talented cartoon, like uber geeks. You know, they're the kind like who were 12 of them would pile into the Marriott for San Diego Comic-Con, right? Like sharing, you know, three on a couch kind of thing. The things they would put up with. And Gene, honestly, at that time was, oh, this is Gene, was photocopying and stapling his mini comics and losing money at every Comic-Con, like all his friends, because that's that was the game. And then we sign up, I'm starting up this imprint. You know, we actually work in the author model. We're not paying page rates, you know, we pay actual advances and we actually treat our authors like authors. Um, and 18 months later, Gene and I are in our tuxes in Times Square at the National Book Awards. And no graphic novel, no comic had ever been nominated for a National Book Award. And that was a very big deal. It was a big deal for, I mean, a lot of people in publishing sat up and took notice. Anyway, so that happens. 
and we're like, this is, this is the typical pattern now I've learned with Jin Yang. It's like, wow, that was a peak moment. Don't get used to it. You know, I mean, that's kind of a high point, you know, then you back to the slog, you know, but no. Three, four months later, there's what's called ALA, if you're not familiar with it, the American Library Association, and they have their awards. And the winner of the prints, and, it, and the people, that, I mean, the other books that were on that list, the finalists, there was like Tobin M. Uh, M. T. Anderson, right? And the book thief, I think, was on that one. I mean, it was, I think all, they were, I mean, they're always good, the ones who make it to the, the, the finalists on the Prince Award, but these were stellar others. And bang, Jin Yang wins the Prince. And again, no comic has ever won the Prince or been nominated for the Prince at this point. Now the National Book Award, super prestigious, okay? The New York Times, the LA Times, the New Yorker, you know, everybody's covering it, NPR is covering it, and it, it sells decently. That golden sticker that not that many people have heard of, that sells a lot more. Because that sticker, we've learned since, that sticker on that book means 80,000 librarians are ordering this book every two years, forever. And that's just one third of our market, right, is the library world. Then there's the trade, which is the bookstores and Amazon, and then the, what's called the direct market, which is the comic shops and the diamond distributor, the diamond mafia. Oops, I said that on record. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So anyway, so Gene, again, you know, the Prince Award, we're like, okay, well, that's that. I mean, that's as high as you can get. You know, where do you go from here? Well, then he starts winning other awards. Like the Chinese Librarians Award was an adult award. So it's going into the adult section as well. So now there's an additional copy going into these libraries around the country. And this amazing thing starts spreading. And then Gene, the story with Gene keeps going up. Every time he seems to break through to some peak, he seems to outdo himself. So his next project was this thing that um, I loved from the start, but it was gonna be a risky project. It was a, it was a the box, Boxers and Saints project. And so it's these events, they're told from two different perspectives, and I brought this to Macmillan. I was like, okay, the next Gene Yang project. And people were kind of shaking their heads, going, because I have a reputation to be a bit of a dreamer, more, more than a businessman. And they're like, yeah, Mark, I mean, it's Gene Yang, so you kind of got to do it, but you're definitely losing money on this one. I mean, a two book box set, I mean, that's really clunky about a war that Americans have never even heard of. I mean, and then that becomes the second comic ever nominated for a National Book Award and still a huge bestseller for us. And then it doesn't stop there. He keeps going and I'm sure most of you know about him already, but he was nominated, in, sorry, he was named the National Ambassador of Children's Literature the first comics artist ever nominated in that capacity. And he's just finishing his two-year tenure. He, you know, he, before him was Kate DiCamillo. So that, then he gets the MacArthur Genius Fellowship <laughs> the same year. Then he's also writing Superman for DC. He's actually writing this new Chinese Superman, totally making history at every step and the Secret Coders series that he's doing for us, which you'll see later. Uh, it just doesn't stop. He also wrote the Avatar comics for Dark Horse, Avatar Last Airbender, which are fantastic. Uh, so this guy, he also happens to be one of the most decent, warm-hearted people that I know. He has this ongoing research about humility. I don't know how many people can say that, but he does. Humility is one of his researches. And he lives it. Um, it's very impressive. So that's one guy. This is another one. This one, Summer, 
Now, this, I'm really fast tracking on the history of First Second because there's about 10 years separating these two books. But they kind of bookend this decade that we've just been through as First Second. So that is Jillian Tamaki and that's Mariko Tamaki, their cousins. And they did this one summer. And this one summer is the first book ever to be a Caldecott honor and a Prince honor. Those are two very different categories of awards. One is a teen award, one is the children's uh, picture book award. And this book, to some controversy, by the way, made it. It's actually the most banned book uh, of 2016, which is good publicity. It actually sells copies <laughs> in most states. There's five or six states that we, we lose a few sales on, but, but it's, a, it's a phenomenal book. It's a, Jillian, I think, is one of those people who's just working in her own space, uh, doing things that I think nobody does. If you, if you look at her, I wish I had some pages to show. If you haven't read it, I urge you to find a copy. Every hand, every pose, every posture, every facial expression is pure story. It's actually, it's quite deep what she's able to do with her brush. Um, so those were two, I'm sorry, I was still, oh, okay, this is something else. Chun, you were there. These are all first, second creators. Some of them are actually buried under there that I think were hidden. I'm not very good at this Google Slides thing, but do you notice anything in common with these people? All of them. And that's a phenomenal amount of women creators. And there's, and there's many more that are not yet in here that are already signed up. And that is something I'm very, very proud of. We've actually, uh, we, we spoke about this in this history of comics uh, on Friday. The moment when manga came and invaded our shores and conquered the bookstores and libraries of America, they, the, the, the appearance of manga caused two very good things to happen. One, it actually caused the big publishing houses to jump into the graphic novel game because they were seeing millions of dollars changing hands and not getting any of it. But the more important thing was creatively, comics in America went from an 85% male readership, and as they say, male, aging male readership, to 65% female readership. Overnight, just about. And out of these readers, people who would grow up to become creators. So it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and that, you know, these are faces of first second. You know, usually my slideshows and presentations, I'm talking about the books and we're looking at the art and we're talking about the story, but it's kind of nice to show you some faces. And when the faces tell you this story, it's an amazing thing. What else? Okay, the secret recipe. So we've got brilliant, talented, skilled creators which that ingredient, you know, takes a bit of hunting and gathering. Then there's belief in editorial care. Now, that, the first few years of First Second, I was very hard pressed to do much editing because I was so consumed with just setting the thing up. Um, then at a certain point I realized like, okay, I need to shift gears uh, because that's really where First Second can shine, is what kind of an editorial home can we be? Now, there are times, and there are cartoonists out there who shall remain nameless, who love to rag on editors. But you know what's interesting? Librarians and editors have something in common. Most people don't really know what we do. Even seasoned authors, I've, I, I was amazed to see an interview with someone who'd been published for 10 years talk about editors, and, and I realized, wow, you really have no idea what I do. And a lot of people think editors are just, you know, sitting on piles of submissions going, yay, 
nay, yay, nay, right? Just like some gatekeeper. And it's not, there's actually, a, a, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but we are supposed to be invisible because the books is what we want people to see. But I believe in editorial care. And sometimes some certain indie cartoonists are very loud on panels at Comic Cons and such about how you know they are free of editors and they're it's great. I'm free to do whatever I want. And some of them, their books are a little tedious, I gotta say. And some of them are their books are are good and the visuals sometimes dazzling, but they could have been great. And they make the mistake, they they are talking about a kind of editing that I don't believe in either. You know, they think it's the DC Marvel idea of like someone controlling you and telling you what to do and it's brand control, right? As opposed to editing, which is a totally different thing. An editor is, I, I think, an ally. Someone who can give you distance from your own work. Now, if you're independently wealthy, you can do like Tolstoy, you know, put your manuscript in a drawer and come back to it in a year. Or find a good editor and have an afternoon a really good session and get that distance. You know, mostly it, a lot of it is about asking questions, asking the right questions. And sometimes I'm just not the right editor for some people. Sometimes we really click and I know I'm giving them good service. It's not about telling people what to do. And it's certainly not, you know, this idea that an editor is someone who just chops stuff, you know, cut this, cut this, cut this, you know. So anyway, there's a lot to say about this particular subject, and I love, for those who are interested, it, that's another workshop, but working in service to a creator means getting inside their vision and helping them, driving them sometimes, to push it all the way. So this is how Jin Yang scripts, okay? This is a page from uh, Boxers and Saints. And you saw this a little bit with the five worlds, like I, I basically took that method, which is the thumbnail and the dialogue. And the idea is he works both at once. And it's very hard actually, sometimes you have to go from a, just a script to artwork, um, but this thumbnail process is where the, the graphic novel really appears. And that's one of the key editorial conversations. That's where I feel like I've, I do my best work helping authors where I, I'm like, wait, what's happening? Why is this like this? What are you trying to do? And in the course of it, this is a very good chance for reworking, rethinking, right? I forget who said writing is rewriting. It's not always true. Some people are very good at their prep. And a lot of their work is this kind of invisible prep. And then they sit down and it comes out, right? And that's, but sometimes that prep work needs to be in the making, in the writing, you know, reworking. You'll see Nidhi's work, Nidhi's beautiful book, Pashmina, which I think is the first Indian American full length graphic novel. I'm very proud to say. And with her, she started out as an illustrator. This really was her debut as a cartoonist. So there was a lot, these are my notes on her very first tiny thumbnail. These are little postage stamp size pages. And the, the, the beauty of doing a thumbnail for you young, young cartoonists is you don't get bogged down in detail. You just get the big, broad strokes of your story. You're not worried about the exact specifics. So there, you know, this is, these are my notes before I would get on a phone call or a video call with Nitty. So I'd scribble some things and then we would get into and discuss like, okay, sometimes we're talking about acting. You know, we're like, is this really like, is this, is this the right emotion? Is this really what's happening here? And why, so, or why are we focused on the mom? Like, isn't, the, isn't Priyanka the, the focus of this scene? So she'll reapproach her scene. And I love this kind of work. This is from Cotton's, which is a book that'll come out next year, Heidi Arnold. And her thumbnails, you know, I kind of have to have her walk me through them. And then here you're gonna see Vera Brosgal on Anya's Ghost. Uh, you're seeing she's going from a loose pencil 
to a tighter pencil. And these are each of these is a different stage to the inking. And then the shading, the color was just one color. Wasn't that cool? It's magic. It is actual magic. It's as magical as being at Hogwarts. Or having what? Ghosts, or having ghosts. So if we had more time, uh, I would tell you about this, which is we're also doing a lot of research and pushing and exploring, finding ways to get inside of storytelling, deeper storytelling. This is one experiment called the Story Trust. There's Jean Yang, there's Sam Bosma, there's Vera Brosgall, and a couple other cartoonists in the first one that I've been conducting. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of workshopping each other's projects without the pressure of um, thinking about the marketplace and the business. And, and we're having fantastic, fantastic results with this new pro the process. I'm going to try and replicate it with others who want to try this. But now those people, you're going to see Vera Brosgall's next project has been through the Story Trust twice, and she, it, it unlocked her own project for her. Uh, and it's not, anyway, there's a lot that I could tell you about with this one, but. So the first second recipe, we've seen brilliant, talented, skilled creators. Is that Rosemary? It is, hi. There's another first second creator, very, very talented one. And actually her work's in the exhibit, so you'll get to see that. Belief in editorial care, hopefully you can see a little bit of that. There's much more to tell with both of these, of course. Then we have this, bridging fields, ages, genres, nations. That's always been in the DNA of First Second. And now you're going to see, I'm going to give you visual indigestion before you even see the exhibit. I'm going to run through a lot of stuff. But you'll see that it really is. So the Dam Keeper, anybody heard of this book? So that's Dice Tsutsumi and Robert Kondo star artists from Pixar who left and started Tonko House, which is going to be, I think, the next Pixar. They did The Dam Keeper. Dice Tsutsumi, a little secret about him is he's Miyazaki's son-in-law. So if you remember Totoro, you remember little May in Totoro? Well, she grew up and married Dice. He, he wouldn't let us say that in our marketing stuff. And this was an Oscar-nominated short, and they, they took this out when they were shopping it. Their agent took them around to all the big publishing houses in New York. And when they walked into my office, they, the first thing they said was, we only want for a second. We want the house of Jean Yang and no other. The door opener. So I owe him a lot, and for them too. But OK, Spill Zone, bridging other fields. Scott Westerfeld is a fantastic. YA novelist, and The Spill Zone is as good as anything he's written. Alex Puvaland, originally DreamWorks grad from the Bay Area here. He's in LA now. OK, Pashmina, I mentioned, and you'll see some, some of Nidhi's work. Also history making. And then you're going to see bridging age categories. So we have really, really young stuff. Have you seen this? Have you seen? You, you have that, right? In the, in the, yeah. I love these. We translated these from France. Anna Banana, they're, they're fantastic picture books. So we have some very, very young books. You see, most publishers in America tend to be more specialized. We do all age categories. And Amer in America, publishing is not really set up that way. Nobody likes a goblin. Little Sid, you're going to see some of Xanthi's artwork. And Ian is here, by the way. That's the, the, the author of Little Sid, right there. And your buddy Jason <laughs> in the same slide. And Matt, actually, the, Matt illustrated Pop. Uh, so these are picture book age. They're comics. They're actual comics, but they really are for the picture book set, for bedtime reading, for story time. Then we have middle grade. And I'm going to go a little faster here, but the middle grade book, the Zeta Space Girl series, yeah, hands are going up. And Mighty Jack, and Mighty Jack 2, and then, then the tie-in, spoiler, to the Zeta universe. And then Boya's book, Chasma Nights, which you're going to see in this coming May. 
And this is, uh, it's just candy at every level for the eye, for the senses. It's totally delightful. Uh, much more, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. Then, still in the middle grade space, we've got this series, Giants Beware, Dragons Beware, Monsters Beware. And just a quick story about these guys, Raf and Jorge, who are preparing another amazing project right now. They were the one time they walked up to me uh, at the San Diego Comic-Con booth. And there's usually, in the space of a Comic-Con, there'll be like 50 people who will come with a portfolio and say, can I show you a project I'm working on? And I kind of have to say yes, because I know it's like it takes courage to just spill your guts in front of a stranger and you know hope something will happen. But it's very rare that anything ever does. Because typically, if they're doing that, they're coming up to a booth, they're not ready yet. Now, these guys came up with this project. They stepped up to the booth, said, could we show you something we're working on? I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. And I flip it open, and two pages, three pages in, I know I'm signing them up. And it's great. It's really great. The GGDG, this is a whole nother thing we could talk about, is the web comics revolution. Like, for a while, web comics were going under the radar of all publishers, but guess who knew about the web comics? Librarians. And I have a few teen librarians around the country who are always recommending certain web comics to us. So you see, the awards, by the way, the awards that were the game changers for us, that totally propelled for a second and made, made the whole experiment work, librarian awards. The people who have, especially, especially the teen librarians, they are actually plugged into their community in a hands-on way, more than booksellers, more than authors. They are interacting with these, with these teens and involving them, and it's, it's an extraordinary thing that's happening. You know? So for us, you know, some publishers schmooze librarians, that's what ALA is for. For us, we're kind of applying to join librarians. That's what we're doing while we serve our authors. You know? So when we have our, our dinners, our meetings, or stuff like that, we're bringing together authors and librarians, and we're telling them, look, friends, people who have a similar mission, you know, working side by side and causing things like this, like we signed up Cucumber Quest. Uh, anybody here follow Cucumber Quest? No, okay, okay, not big web comics crowd. That's okay. You can always read the book. There's gonna be a physical book, four physical books. They're already out, in fact. Then we have the teen. I'm gonna go a little faster. The teen, there's a lot of great teen award-winning spinning is Tilly Walden's um, skating memoir. And then we have Adult. That, that was a little abrupt. I didn't get my special effects on that one. So Demon is definitely, definitely adult. It should come with warning labels. It should not be anywhere near the young reader's section. It's insane, it's depraved, but it's genius. It's amazing stuff. And that's Jason Shiga, who's a, a genius, truly. Zara's Paradise, you're going to see some of the artwork. That was our Iranian, I mean, just think about it. What you've seen here is like, you've been seeing authors who are Christians, who are Buddhists, who are Jewish, who are Hindu, who are Muslim. I mean, it, you know, we could take any line of diversity and you will find it in for a second. And it's always been that way. It's not like we jumped on that bandwagon last year, suddenly. Um, Tin Pham. This amazing sumo, which also there's artwork of, you'll see that. Is Tin here? Tin, man, where are you? <laughs> and then The Hunting Accident, which is our great, a big adult book that has just come out. It's, it's literally big, it's a brick. It's an enormous thing, it could be a weapon almost, but it's brilliant. If we had more time, I would tell you more about it. It's, it's very deep, meaningful, ambitious storytelling. So you get the idea. It's the full spectrum, right? We're, we're going everywhere that the graphic novel will go. Uh, little Matt artwork there. So this first second secret recipe, brilliant, talented, skilled creators, belief in editorial care, bridging fields, ages, oops, 
sorry. What was that last one? Oh, pushing up, broadening, exploring the medium. So raising the standard in every way we can, on ourselves, on our creators. Every season we do a little, it's not a post-mortem, it's more an adding up, a tally. What did we screw up? There's always a lot of stuff we screw up. What can we do better? And so you can see some of the things that are groundbreaking. Jin Yang managed to pull this off. You know, it's a, it's a coding, it's Hogwarts for coders is what it is. That's basically the pitch. And he's teaching coding. And I usually, it's, I'm very suspicious of people who try to do a good story and teach and give a, an actual message. It's a recipe for disaster. He pulls it off. It actually works. And there's six of them total. Then we have George O'Connor, who is a rock star. He gets on the road and people squeal when he arrives in school visits. And he's doing the Olympians. And there's like a black market of these books in my kid's school. And, and this is the, the earliest source material on Greek myths he's working from. And he's doing it in a very American comics style. Right? And, and they're doing phenomenally well. So this has become the new Dolaires. If you're familiar with Dolaire, that was the reference for kids to go and learn their Greek myths. This is it. Hey, hi, the whole family. And what have we got? Okay, now this I'm very, very proud of. We're launching a number of programs, we call them. And one of them is science comics. So imagine a series that has really strong, solid, high quality science and really strong, high quality comics rolled into one. So we have experts on each of these fields. We started out with four titles. We were gonna just test the waters. Before the first one was even printed, the pre-orders went through the roof. And we, and we went and set up another 18. And we have, they're going to be like the new eyewitness books. And, these, and what we do, it's, it's really cool. The whole, the whole setup is amazing. So for example, take dogs up there. Science Comics dogs. We take, there'll be a hook, like dogs. Everybody loves dogs. What it's really about is DNA, right? The breeds and all this. We're actually getting inside of DNA. So each book opens up a different branch of science. So for example, coral reefs gets you into climate change, right? So all this stuff, and by the way, we're sneaking this stuff in the reddest states. <laughs> we're like, comics always fly under the radar, they're going out, baby, they're out there, you know, they're in Sarah Palin country. It's pretty awesome. And there's a lot more coming. So the first second secret recipe. Librarians, for real, for real. The librarians, they are part of the secret recipe. And I feel like, you know what, the librarians are not just working with first second. When you see those graphic novel sections, they're stocked with their Scholastic and now Lion Forge and you know, all the houses are repped there. But I feel like our mission and our MO and everything we do is inextricably wound up with, bound up with librarians. So you have people like, wait, did I put a slide in here? Yes. Candace Mack at the Los Angeles Public Library. These are, the, these are my rock stars. These are some heroes. And she, you know, these, these librarians are champions of the graphic novel. Here's another three awesome ones. <laughs> and so actually Eva is here. Eva in the middle is sitting right over there. Eva is in Alameda, at the Alameda, uh, what? Alameda Free. Alameda Free Library. Next on her right is, is Snow Wildsmith, who's in Asheville now. She's back in the library thing after a little hiatus. And then over there is Robin Brenner, who's in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And these are awesome. I, I, if I had more time, I would share a lot more of their cosplay. <laughs> and there were some, some of the, those pin-up shots that were just too sexy for this pr presentation. <laughs> And this is back to our Sausalito branch, little local library. 
you know, and you see this, right? Somebody, somebody took the time, the trouble is, you know, showing up every day with this mission. And honestly, this is not hyperbole. Librarians are forces for good. They are, they are a bulwark against the forces of darkness and ignorance and, and cruelty that are now actually so rampant. So more than ever, the meaning and the, the vital, vital importance of a library, it's just, you know, as it gets darker, bright things are glowing brighter, you know, and libraries are suddenly standing out as the saviors for some of us. So what's next? And we're almost done with this. Okay, now check this out. This is a set of authors. Okay, so we've got C. Spike Trotman, Ngozi Okezu, she's Check Please, which is the crazy runaway success. When she came visiting our offices, it turned out half the editors in Macmillan in the Flatiron Building were fans of Check Please. It's like, it's an amazing, if you haven't seen it, that's a webcomic you should also check out. It's, it's this kind of gay hockey players and she imagines a world where it's basically a world without any toxic masculinity. It's like, hum, you know, not, they're males and they're masculine and they're not toxic males. It's a very clever thing she does. Saul Williams right there, best-selling, the most read black American poet after Maya Angelou is writing Martyr Loser King for us. That is Gigi DG who does Cucumber Quests, her purple portrait, because you can't even, on, online you cannot find a portrait of her. She, I, I don't know why she decided to be very, very private. Up there is Toby Cypress, who's an amazing, amazing master of the brush. Brian McDonald, a guru of storytelling, who's written two, two scripts for us, including one of them called Land of the Dead, and it's about storytelling, it's a nonfiction about storytelling, and down there is Ron Wimberly. So you can see, for a while, we, we, you know, we had a lot of Asians and not a lot of African Americans, and they're coming. You're gonna see some incredible talent in our list. Vera Brosgal, if you remember Anya's Ghost, it really is a masterpiece. Leave Me Alone was a Caldecott Honor picture book that she did, which is amazing. And her next one is called Be Prepared. And, and Be Prepared, it is phenomenal. It is a marvelous, marvelous thing about going to a, it's a memoir of going to a Russian Orthodox summer camp. And then we've got, oh, this I'm so proud of. So Penelope, Penelope Bajur is her real name. Penelope Bajur is, is um, French. She, she's the number one graphic novelist in France right now. Her blog was the number one red blog at one point a few years ago. And she's moved to Brooklyn, and we've published a couple of her books. This is Brazen, Rebel Ladies Who Rocked the World. It's 30 portraits of amazing women from all different eras, all different parts of the world. Each one is about four pages. And I'm so, I mean, there's uh, Margaret Hamilton, who is the Wicked Witch, there's Josephine Baker, there's, um, and then there's some you've never heard of, there's some African princesses, there's some uh, all kinds of stories. That's gonna be a big, big book coming soon. Oh, and it's being serialized in the, the Washington Post relaunched The Lily, which is the earliest feminist newspaper. And they relaunched it, staffed and written entirely by women, and they're gonna serialize Brazen in it. So there, that's, almost a little over, I urge you all to sign up for the first second newsletter if you want to follow what we do. There's a lot of stuff in there. And I think that's my last slide. And that was a little run. Did I give you graphic indigestion? <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you really enjoy this exhibit. I hope you all go visit the Museum of Cartoon Art right near Fisherman's Wharf. It's a beauty. And see you at the reception.